Racecraft, The Soul of Inequality in American Life by Barbara J. Fields and Karen Fields. This is the introduction. In the beginning was the deed. Um, that was a quotation from Ludwig Wittgenstein quoting Goethe, who was misquoting John the Apostle. The idols of the tribe have their foundation in human nature itself and in the tribe or race of men. That was a quote from Francis Bacon. Race is the witchcraft of our time. And that was a quote from M.F. Ashley Montague. During the 2008 presidential election campaign, hardly a week passed without a reference to America's post-racial society, which the election of Barack Obama supposedly would establish. If anyone really was imagining such a thing as a post-racial America, what that might be was hard to pin down. Right through the campaign, references to race and the race card kept jostling the post in post-racial. When insinuations about Obama's supposedly foreignness cropped up, one journalist called that the new race card. In fact, it is among the oldest and most durable. Pronouncing native-born Americans of African descent to be aliens goes as far back as Thomas Jefferson and the other founders. More than a century later, D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation launched American cinema with the same pronouncement in its opening sequence. And a few days after the 2008 vote, suits filed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey to overturn President Obama's election denied his American birth in order to deny his citizenship. Far from holding mere playing cards in their hands, those who brought suit had historical bedrock under their feet and a ready-made place in national discourse. How and why a handful of racist notions have gained permanent sustenance in American life is the subject of this book. Other supposedly new notions are just as old and as deeply embedded. Today's talk of biracial or multiracial people rehabilitates mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, and the like. Yesterday's terms for mixed ancestry. Although they now reemerge in the costume of post-racial progressiveness, not to say a move toward an ideal future of racelessness, their origins are racist. Mulatto made its first appearance on the U.S. Census in 1850 after two theorists, Josiah Knott, a physician, and James DeBow, a polit uh, political economist, decided to classify and count individuals with one parent of African and one of European descent. Today's lobbying for a new census classification called multiracial defines it the same way. Someone with two monoracial parents. Does it matter that these citizen rejuvenators of obsolete racist categories cannot reasonably share the agenda of their predecessors? to validate the folk theory that mixed offspring are degenerate in mind and body. Today, some parents passionately seek a state-sponsored classification as a means of protecting their own children from feelings that enter all American children's minds via toxic drip. Self-esteem is directly tied to accurate racial identity, said one mother. Whatever she thought she was seeing about mixed ancestry and mental health, the very phrase accurate racial identity ought to set off sirens. Dangerous lies do not always dress the part. Where but in recycled racist fiction are monoracial parents to be found to serve as guarantors of accurate racial identity? The least one can say is that the fiction mi misrepresents the American experience. According to an estimate derived from decades of census reports, some 24% of Americans listed in 1970 as white probably had African ancestors, while more than 80% of those listed as black had non-African ones, which implies that there were nearly twice as many white as black Americans of African descent. Thomas Jefferson's descendants fit both descriptions. But misrepresentation is not all. While redacting America's real history, the fiction revives an old fallacy, the move by definition from the concept mixture to the false inference that unmixed components exist, which cannot be disproved by observation and experience because it does not arise from them. 
In the 20th century, that logic had hideous real-world consequences. In the comparative innocence of the 19th, the same logic aligned itself with a zeal for measurement and percentages of mixture between theoretically unmixed individuals beckoned as avenues of further investigation. In due course, the Census Bureau experimented with the classifications quadroon and octoroon, respectively an individual with a black grandparent or a black great-grandparent. Some states enacted laws to prevent people with African ancestry from passing as white and set up genealogical research procedures to detect violators. In sum, restoring notions of race mixture to center stage recommits us willy-nilly to the discredited idea of racial purity, the basic premise of bioracism. The latter, meanwhile, is neither gone nor forgotten. Bioracism is a more precise appellation for the 19th century research, just sketched than the more usual term, race science. For all the measuring and experimenting that research inspired, it failed as science. Modern genetics began afresh and on a basis so different as perhaps to deserve labeling non-racial. Race in today's biology is not a traditionally named group of people, but a statistically defined population. The definite, or er, sorry, the difference in frequency of alleles between populations, contiguous and interbreeding groups of the same species. Unlike the units of bioracism, these populations are not held to be visible to the naked eye or knowable in advance of disciplined investigation. So the news is not good when scientists studying the human genome, adept in some of the 21st century's most sophisticated research techniques, hark back to the old notion, yoking those techniques to a system of classifying people that is steeped in folk thought. They have a choice in the matter. Today's probable probabilistic methods and molecular biological evidence by no means compel resort to the folk system. Indeed, they would seem to be incompatible with it. Therefore, if the scientific logic is indeed non-racial, the folk classification ought to wither un under its influence. To adhere to both old and new is to pick up and put down modern science with shameless promiscuity. However, such picking up and putting down has its defenders, sometimes offering defenses so remarkable as to justify this book's new coinage, racecraft. That term highlights the ability of pre- or non-scientific modes of thought to hijack the minds of the scientifically literate. Here, an anthropologist defends the traditional folk classification. After all, genetics has added very little to what scientists, or indeed any observant people, have known for centuries about human groups. Modern genetics can be a bit more technically specific, but the bas basic truths are not new. The anthropologist proceeds to justify on grounds, of on grounds of data processing convenience, the routine use of subjects race as categorical checkbox check variables in studies to identify epidemiological risk factors. Notice that even where properly genetic risk factors exist, no part of the procedure, as described, prevents the subject's race from being taken before the fact to explain whatever is found after the fact. A psychologist has noted the garbage in, garbage out circularity of elegant experimental designs and statistical analyses applied to biologically meaningless racial categories. The checkbox method reduces genetics to a matter of querying or simply glancing at the research subject. If looks like genetics and says so genomics are respectable tools, what indeed could modern science add to popular belief? Fortunately, not all American scientists choose to yoke their technological racehorse to the century's old ox cart. J. Craig Venter, whose imagination accelerated to warp speed the race to map the human genome, reflected on his work autobiographically in A Life Decoded. 
In his depiction, Mapping the Human Genome, Genome revealed nature's real world of irremediably diverse individuality. Venter's own, the first geno genome ever to be posted online, as well as everyone else's. Nature's world of diverse individuality is precisely not one that observant people have known about for centuries. Rather, that world stands open to fresh discoveries about nature and the makeup of human beings. Venter links his own susceptibility to asthma to probable genetic determinants that he shares with various statistical populations of Americans. Presented in a series of insets, his own particulars disclose enormous complexity. Not known for centuries, for instance, is the family of enzymes glutathione S transferase GST, variants of which found on chromosomes 1 and 11 are believed to affect individuals' allergic response to diesel exhaust particles. Other sites also seem to be involved. Venter's own combination may be red, and the reading suggests why he must reach for an inhaler on a foggy San Francisco day. Venter's way of introducing new science to a lay public seems more in accord with the ingrained individualism that so impressed early visitors to America, like Alexis de Tocqueville in the 1830s, than with the ingrained anti-individualism that the very word gene evokes for many today. Venter makes few concessions to that anti-individualism, whatever phase of his work of life he is recounting, and race has no entry in his book's index. When questions arose about his decision to take his private human genome project's five samples from individuals who differed by what Americans call race, he implied that the point was to help illustrate that the concept of race has no genetic or scientific basis and that there is no way to tell one ethnicity from another in the five cholera genomes. Surely a caution against the widespread habit of treating race and genetics as though they were interchangeable terms. Later, he told a BBC interviewer that skin color as a surrogate for race is a social concept, not a scientific one. Venter was surely mistaken, however, when he suggested that greater scientific literacy might help combat altogether predictable discrimination in the use of genomics. That bit of naive catechism glares amid the sophistication of the book as a whole. Few can claim greater scientific literacy than James D. Watson, a Nobel laureate for his work in, on DNA and founding director of the Public Human Genome Project. Yet remarks he made to interviewers during his 2007 book promotion trip to London owed less to that scientific literacy than to the racist certainties in which many Chicagoans of his generation were reared. Pronouncing himself inherently gloomy about the prospects of Africa, Watson said that all our social policies are based on the fact that their intelligence is the same as ours, whereas testing says not really. Indeed, in his view, reason is not properly regarded as some universal heritage of humanity. For evidence, however, the man of science resorted to personal impressions haphazardly collected. People who have to deal with black employees find this is not true. From his digest of anecdotes, he went on to prophesy that genetic evidence for black people's lesser intelligence would emerge within a decade. But his statement does not acquire validity because a duly ordained scientist utters it. The sirens went off immediately. Certain of Watson's fellow molecular bi biologists took the floor with a scientifically correct formulation. It was not possible to draw such conclusions from the work that has been done on DNA. Dr. Venter, who happened to be traveling in the United Kingdom at the same time, said, there is no basis in scientific fact or in the human genetic code for the notion that skin color will be predictive of intelligence. For his part, Watson did not defend himself by citing his own scientific work to date or anyone else's. Reporters later observed that he at first denied what he had said and seemed stunned, perhaps, a pr and seemed stunned, period. Perhaps a pre-scientific layer of his mind had taken over momentarily. Not all who piled onto Dr. Watson can claim to differ fundamentally from him. 
Shortly after he published his own genome online, scientists at Iceland's Decode Genetics startled the world with a revelation. Watson had 16 times more genes of black origin than the average white European, 16% rather than the 1% that most of his origin would have. This level is what you expect you would expect in someone who had a great grandparent who was African. In other words, Dr. Watson is someone whom 19th century census takers would have classified as an octoroon if they had been able to see behind appearance. In those days, a technology able to expose genes of black origin expressed in percentages no less would have appealed to people who yearned for a surefire way to know an octoroon when, when you could not know by looking. Watson's comeuppance so deliciously prompt upon the sin occasioned so much laughter that it is easy to miss the unhappy fact that decode genetics' researchers themselves yoked the new technology to use to the uses of yore. <clears throat> As if all that were not enough, now comes a technofad that purports to determine the so-called tribal origins of Afro-Americans with the help of personal genetic histories. The same method and logic might equally have revealed Dr. Watson's African tribal origins to the world. Anyone who is committed to thinking of tribes as objectively occurring biological phenomena cannot think differently about bio-racists race, or races. What an irony then, if the World War II defeat of the Nazis did indeed discredit race science, only to have the yearning for identity and the jaw swabs of Afro-American biogenealogists abet its revival. Whatever the post may mean in post-racial, it cannot mean that racism belongs to the past. Post-racial turns out to be simply racial, which is to say racist. Something is afoot that is the business of every citizen who thought that the racist concepts of a century ago were gone and good riddance as a result of the civil rights movement. The continued vitality of those concepts stands as a reminder that, however important a historical watershed the election of an African-American president may be, America's post-racial era has not been born. Perhaps it can be made if America lets those concepts go. But if they are hard to let go, why is that? What are they made of? How do they work? And what work do they do? Those are our subjects in the coming chapters. For now, we sketch our answers briefly and bluntly, so as not to preempt the essays to come. One general point must be made at the outset, however, and with an important caveat. Racist concepts do considerable work in political and economic life, but if they were merely an appendage of politics and economics, without intimate roots in other phases of life, their, persuasive, their persuasiveness would accordingly diminish. From very early on, Americans wove racist concepts into a public language about inequality that made black the virtual equivalent of poor and lower class, thus creating a distinctive idiom that has no parallel in other Western democracies. The French Revolution assigned universal validity to the slogan Liberté, Égalité, Égalité, Fraternité. By contrast, America's rendering of the same sentiments added asterisks, for it had to make sense of an anomalous reality. The presence of native-born people who were foreign, hard-working people who were not free. When Tocqueville sought to convey to French readers the racist prejudice he found in the United States, North and South, a signal exception to the enthusiasm for equality that he duly noted, he wrote that he could draw no direct comparison from French experience. Instead, he proposed as an analogy the gut-level physical repugnance aristoc aristocrats felt toward their equally white but unequally born compatriots. In that tiny vignette of white-on-white -white struggles in France lay the kernel of a legitimate public language to come in which the French might tackle class inequality in straightforward terms. In America, straightforward talk about class inequality is all but impossible, indeed taboo. Political appeals to the economic self-interest of ordinary voters, as distinct from their wealthy compatriots, court instant branding and disfigurement in the press as divisive economic populism 
or even class warfare. On the other hand, divisive political appeals composed in a different register, sometimes called cultural populism, enlist voters' self-concept in place of their self-interest, appealing in other words to who they are and are not, rather than to what they require and why. Thus, the policies of the 1980s radically redistributed income upward. Then, with economic populism shooed from the public arena, cultural populism fielded something akin to a marching band. It had a simple melody about the need to enrich the investing classes, said to create jobs, and an encoded percussion culture wars, welfare mothers, underclass, race and IQ, black and black on black crime, criminal gene, on and on. Halfway through the decade, as the band played on, a huge economic revolution from above had got well underway. The poorest 40% of American families were sharing 15.5% of household income, while the share of the richest 20% of families had risen to a record 43.7%, and the trend appeared to be, and has turned out to be, more and more of the same. The late Derek Bell seems to have coined the phrase post-racial. In his 1990 essay, After We're Gone, Prudent Speculations on America in a Post-Racial Epoch, he intended not to gesture at a vague future state, but to examine the relationship between two developments of the 1980s, the need to manage politically the radical redistribution of income toward the well-to-do and the suffocation of public sentiment favorable to civil rights. <clears throat> Bell used allegory. Space traders arrive with a, with a proposal for America's deciders. They will sell America a proven technology for producing unlimited wealth and will buy in return every living Afro-American. Their deal poses constitutional and moral problems, obviously, but also a practical one. The practical problem is not whether to accept the deal, which is inevitable, but how to couch, stage manage, and spin it. Bell portrays the ensuing national conversation with hilarious fidelity to its real-world models. In taking the deal, however, the deciders overlook a fundamental problem. The traditional political language will become obsolete the instant the ships lift off. What then? The curtain falls and bits and pieces are heard as post-racial America confronts state straightforwardly for the first time, the problem of who gets what part of the nation's wealth and why. Strange though it may seem, The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life, 1994, by Richard Hernstein and Charles Murray, provided a Coda de Bell's, to, a Coda de Bell's article after we're gone, 1990. Contrary to a strenuously promoted race and IQ public identity, The Bell Curve, is far more centrally a class and IQ book, a story about a society that no longer rewards hard work by the not very smart. Furthermore, the authors, like Bell, not only cite the top heavy income distribution, they also begin where he does, with many white Americans faring badly. Where Bell sees politics, however, they see nature, with born winners and losers, not tilted playing fields or policies with intended outcomes. They conclude, therefore, from the same statistics as Bell's, that a cognitive elite has pulled away from the rest of population economically, becoming more prosperous even as real wages in the rest of the economy stagnated or fell. If smart people are gaining ground by virtue of their IQ, Hardworking others are losing ground by virtue of theirs. Who now remembers this principal story of the bell curve? In the time it takes to say racecraft, growing class inequality, the shared theme of their work in bells became inaudible despite its prominence in a very long book. Furthermore, if the main story went unheard, the reason is not that the author spoke softly. A year before publication, Charles Murray contributed a raise the alarm piece to the Wall Street Journal about the coming white underclass. Burdened with unemployment, illegitimacy, jail, in short, telltale exudations of class in America, not race, Murray's white underclass was identical to its black counterpart. 
What is more, Murray and Hernstein made no bones about their scientifical ideological agenda to counteract the perversions of the egalitarian, egalitarian ideal that began with the French Revolution. Indeed, the bell curve opens with a quotation by Edmund Burke, a fierce detractor of that revolution, who made no bones about upholding the very same natural distinctions that Tocqueville the aristocrat deployed as an analogy to American racism. Imagine the fallout if the media had aired then, in a national conversation about class, the truly controversial views of these two authors. Indeed, what might happen today if neoconservatives addressed hardworking, moral, marrying, and until recently respectably employed Americans with the author's lodestar belief. The good society promotes contentment, say they, simply by having a place for everyone, even for those who aren't very smart. Indeed, a valued place. To explain what that place might be, they offer a pragmatic definition at once serene and ruthless. You occupy, you occupy a valued place. Their italics, oh, that's just, it's in italics. <laughs> you occupy a valued place if other people would miss you when you were gone. In their version of America's future, the raised voices that Bell imagined are to hold their peace. Perhaps the economic turmoil that lent resonance to Barack Obama's call for change may itself provide an opening toward better things than that. The debacle of the bankers rubbed the gloss from the justifications for inequality that prevailed in the 1980s. Americans of all colors now have good evidence that genetic testing back then for the criminal gene missed a bet by taking samples only among the incarcerated while ignoring well-heeled virtuosos of thievery. Besides, Americans have taken a good look at incompetence rewarded with outsized pay and perks, while ordinary workers' day in, day out competence has failed even to protect their jobs. The image of CEOs gliding into Washington in silver jets, hands outstretched for taxpayers' money, has disrupted the old icons. The welfare mother can no longer stand for what is not right with America. The authors have been living through recent events as Afro-Americans of Southern origin and as, and as American citizens, but it is in another capacity, as teachers whose students are, all, are of all colors and origins, that we present these chapters. They begin with a guided tour of racecraft, followed by a joint essay in which we highlight common metaphors, such as the so-called racial divide that becloud and misdirect thought. Three chapters examine America's past while testing the lenses, sometimes poorly ground, through which historians today try to see what happened in the past and understand why and with what lasting consequences. Another revisits a classic by the great anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritchard, who showed how witch beliefs could be held by rational people. The last is an imaginary conversation between two great sociologists, Emile Durkheim and W. E. B. Dubois, whose different national histories, French and American, confronted them with similar predicaments. The conclusion synthesizes what the preceding essays show about the intimate interaction between racecraft and inequality in American life. Throughout, we strive to think rigorously about the world of experience that Americans designate by the shorthand, race. That very shorthand is our abiding target because it confuses three different things race, racism, and racecraft. The term race stands for the conception or the doctrine that nature produced humankind in distinct groups, each defined by inborn traits that its members share and that differentiate them from the members of other distinct groups of the same kind, but of unequal rank. For example, the Races of Europe, published in 1899 to wide acclaim and lasting influence, set out to establish scientifically the distinctness of the Teutonic, Alpi Alpine, and Mediterranean races. After compiling tens of thousands of published measurements of stature, shape, of head and nose, coloring of skin, hair and eyes, and more, the author, William Z. Ripley, had more than enough quantitative evidence to work with. Indeed, far too much. A taxonomic nightmare loomed up and forced on him a certain flexibility of method, shifting criteria as needed, ignoring unruly instances, and employing ad hoc helpers like the index of negrescence 
to handle the variable coloring of persons indigenous to the British Isles. Fitting actual humans to any such grid inevitably calls forth the busy repertoire of strange maneuvering that is part of what we call racecraft. The 19th century bioracists ultimately vain search for traits with which to demarcate human groups regularly exhibited such maneuvering. Race is the principal unit and core concept of racism. Racism refers to the theory and the practice of applying a social, civic, or legal double standard based on ancestry and to the ideology surrounding such a double standard. That may be what the economist Glenn Lurie intends when he identifies a withholding of the presumption of equal humanity. Racism is not an emotion or state of mind, such as intolerance, bigotry, hatred, or malevolence. If it were that, it would easily be overwhelmed. Most people mean well most of the time, and in any case are usually busy pursuing other purposes. Racism is first and foremost social practice, which means that it is an action and a rationale for action, or both at once. Racism always takes for granted the objective reality of race as just defined, so it is important to register their distinctness. The shorthand transforms racism, something an aggressor does, into race, something the target is, and a sleight of hand that is easy to miss. Consider the statement, black southerners were segregated because of their skin color, a perfectly natural sentence to the ears of most Americans, who tend to overlook its weird causality. But in that sentence, segregation disappears as the doing of, se of segregationists, and then in a puff of smoke, puff reappears as a trait of only one part of the segregated whole. In similar fashion, enslavers disappear only to reappear, disguised in stories that append physical traits, physical traits defined as slave-like to those enslaved. Jefferson became so entangled in the reversals as to declare that the very people white Americans had lived with for over 160 years as slaves would be, after emancipation, too different for white people to live with any longer. He proposed that slaves be freed and promptly deported, their lost labor to be supplied through the importation of white laborers. His catalog of differences went from skin color, they do not blush, and internal organs, they secrete less by the kidneys, to intellect and imagination, they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous, and even emotion. Their griefs are transient, he's, he asserted without irony. Even so, as a man of science, Jeff Jefferson qualified, I advance it therefore as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. He thus recognized the oddity of his position, even if intermittently, through the offhand, or yeah, off, oh sorry, through the off and on blinking of racecraft. Distinct from race and racism, racecraft does not refer to groups or to ideas about groups' traits, however odd both may appear in close up. It refers instead to mental terrain and to pervasive belief. Like physical terrain, racecraft exists objectively, it has topographical features that Americans regularly navigate and we cannot readily stop traversing it. Unlike physical terrain, racecraft originates not in nature, but in human action and imagination. It can exist in no other way. The action and imagining are collective yet individual, day-to-day -day yet historical and consequential, even though nested in mundane routine. The action and imagining emerge as part of moment-to-moment -moment practicality that is, thinking about and executing every purpose under the sun. Do not look for racecraft, therefore only where it might be said to belong. Finally, racecraft is not a, a euphemistic substitute for racism. It is kind of fingerprint evidence that racism has been on the scene. Our term racecraft invokes witchcraft, though not for the reason that may come first to mind. We regard neither witchcraft nor racecraft as just mischievous superstition, nothing more. 
a position Lowry has rightly dismissed as of little interest. Far from denying the rationality of those who have accepted either belief as truth about the world, we assume it. We are interested in the processes, processes of reasoning that manage to make both plausible. Witchcraft and racecraft are imagined, acted upon, and reimagined. The action and imagining inextricably intertwined. The outcome is a belief that presents itself to the mind and imagination as a vivid truth. So wrote W.E.H. Lecky, a British scholar of Europe's past, who, looking back from the 19th century, tried to understand how very smart people managed for a very long time to believe in witchcraft. He warned that it takes a strong effort of the imagination to realize the position of the defenders of the belief. To realize, in his sense, is to picture a bygone real world of normally constituted people who accepted as obviously true notions that the real world of one's own present dismisses as obviously false. What if we Americans applied that strong effort to our present? Only if we imagined racecraft as a thing in itself worth scrutiny might we imagine ourselves outside or beyond the belief. It is impossible to understand what post-racial might be without first understanding more profoundly than we do at present just what racial is. Of course, it is easier to see the movement between imagining and doing, reimagining and redoing, when it is they who are doing it rather than ourselves. Distance can magnify. The they in Europe who believed in witchcraft includes great reformers like Martin Luther, whose wit and logic against the superstition he abhorred crackle on the page. Yet Luther not only made witchcraft accusations, but also repeatedly emerged, physically exhausted from his own wrestling with spirits. It could not be otherwise. He grew up hearing folk notions about witches and their doings, taking them in with mother's milk and his native tongue. In adulthood, he asserted that a person could steal milk by thinking of a cow and that his mother had contracted asthma via a neighbor's evil eye. As he lay dying, he saw a demon. Such reports conveyed nothing improbable to him or to his hearers. Their understandings about the world took for granted the existence of an active, well-populated, invisible realm that manifested itself in the realm of the seen as real things, events, and persons. Everyday experience reinforced those understandings, which in turn had bearing on everyday behavior and in the recounting of events. Thus, Luther recounts, in a single thought, his mother's chronic asthma and her stated belief that a neighbor's evil eye caused it, and her own explanation, that the woman had repeatedly rebuffed her friendly overtures. Today, the incompleteness of this explanation jumps off the page, for our everyday understanding denies power to the gaze. For example, in the common phrase, if looks could kill. For Luther and his hearers, however, a physical explanation has disappeared into a thicket of circumstances on the surface of life and visible to all. Local lore and a twice told tale about neighbors thereafter conceal the gap between the illness and the gaze. Thus, for everyday intents and purposes, the gap does not come into view, and the question of ordinary cause and effect does not arise. In that light, consider again the weird incompleteness of the explanatory formula, because of skin color. How might an American account for the causal mechanism at work in that phrase? Luther's story about the milkless cow exposes another facet of suspended causality. As before, he begins with a mundane predicament, but rather than ignore the question, how, he answers explicitly. Reminding his flock that witches do many accursed things while they remain undiscovered, he gives them a, to us, show-stopping causal sequence. <clears throat> Thinking about some cow, they can say one good word or another and get milk from a towel, a table, or a handle. Everyone present knows the ordinary sequence, creeping into someone else's barn, scurrying away with a sloshing pail, but the preacher has made it plain that the thievery is not of that order. It is invisible thievery. They remain undiscovered. Then and there, cause and effect disappear into the smoky notion of witches. By definition, people who can do accursed things that, by definition, are the things witches can do. Like pure races a while ago, Luther's witches enter the world and come to matter therein, not by observation and experience, but by circular reasoning. 
neither which nor pure race has a material existence. Both are products of thought and of language. Having no material existence, they cannot have material causation. Strictly speaking, Luther's explanation omitted nothing essential. Witchcraft has no moving parts of its own, and needs none. It acquires perfectly adequate moving parts when a person acts upon the reality of the imagined thing. The real action creates evidence for the imagined thing. By that route, belief of that sort constantly dumps fictitious evidence for itself into the real world. In Luther's day, learned jurists and ecclesiastics produced mountains of such evidence. The specialized language of the proceedings generated evidence by shaping routine modes of narrating invisible, nay impossible, events. The very pageantry of witchcraft trials yielded more evidence, and drastic executions of accursed people still more of it, a kind of material proof that bad things happen to bad people. Lucky like concluded, if we considered witchcraft probable, a hundredth part of the evidence we possess would have placed it beyond the region of doubt. Correspondingly, if Ripley's readers had considered racecraft improbable, his classification would have trapped him well within the region of doubt. In both instances, there was vast and varied evidence, but of what? Of products of imagining, realized in everyday practice. Here, paraphrased, is an exchange between an unbelieving interviewer with the American children or grandchildren of European immigrants who believed in the evil eye. Question, how does the evil eye work? Answer, some people are known to have it. Question, how do you know that? Answer, I have seen X's remedy work. Question, is it always effective? Answer, I know for a fact that it worked for so-and-so. Today, as in the 16th century, logical hopscotch of that kind is the warp and woof of banal sociability. <coughs> the talkers respond to, but ignore the interviewer's question about the mechanism of the evil eye. It exists, period. The interviewer does not press and does not need to. Those present do not query assumptions, the nature of available evidence or the coherence of their reasoning from the evidence. What they know, they know intimately, but not well. Such is the stuff that racecraft is made of. It occupies a middle ground between science and superstition, an invisible realm of collective understandings, a half-lit zone of the mind's eye. Dr. Watson was operating within it when he prophesied breakthroughs in genetics to account for things that happen when white people like him have to deal with black employees. That a scientist of his stature slipped into that half-light demonstrates the ease with which scientific and non-scientific thinking conflate in the minds of individuals. Had he been chatting over his back fence with a like-minded or risk-averse neighbor, rather than to a battalion of journalists, there would have been no uproar, and the world would have missed a sober lesson. Science is forever dogged by those seductive cousins and ancient antagonists which Francis Bacon named idols of the tribe. In their grip, Luther, a powerful dialectician, held both a workaday notion of cause and effect and a phantasmic folk belief that contradicted it, and so too did his learned contemporaries. Lucky again, the acutest lawyers and ecclesiastics confronted evidence that extends to tens of thousands of cases in almost every country of Europe. For them, as for less well-educated people, there was little to impose the idea of absurdity or of improbability on stories about old women riding on broomsticks. What about here and now? Americans acquire in childhood all it takes to doubt stories of witchcraft, but little, little in our childhood leads us to doubt racecraft. For us, as for bygone believers and witches, daily life produces an immense accumulation of supporting evidence for the belief. Think no further than the media-born mis miscellany of things tabulated by race, from hardy perennials like teenage pregnancy to novelties like underrepresentation among blood donors and disproportionate representation on Twitter, constantly churning out factitious evidence for an ever-expanding American immensity, the so-called racial divide. A recent instance carried out under the sign of socio sociological theory includes familiar features. For example, ma mapping genomic data onto census, that is, folk, 
racial categories and assuming a genetic origin for social conduct, with the absent supporting evidence expected any day now. Lucky's subjects had authoritative sources in the science and law of the day. So do we. For them, but no less for us, it is it often is or seems impossible for so much evidence to accumulate around a conception which has no basis in fact. To them, witchcraft was obvious, not odd. Turn now to a tour of racecraft. Will its features seem, fami seem familiar or strange, obvious or odd?